Well, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to some some of our sangha online. Uh, does someone want to just click that little? We do it on the pad. Yeah, that's it. Can you hold it? Just the just hit the got it. There we go. One of the uh, first instructions we're given for Zazen is to observe the breath. To notice the in-breath and notice the out-breath. And it's a a meditation practice that we can just take into our daily life. There's many times throughout the day when it's very be beneficial to just take a moment and be aware of our breath. If we're just a little excited, a little anxious, a little worried, a little concerned, confused, any of those sort of emotional states, we can just for a moment become, become aware of our breath. It's like a little reset. And uh, we have other meditation practices that are kind of focused on something in particular, like focusing on the breath, focusing on sound. Uh, bringing our attention to our body particularly in Zazen, just noticing our posture, are we upright? Um, so these, these meditation practices, including koan practice, where you'll, you just bring lightly to mind the koan that you're working with, or uh, contemplation practice, contemplating interdependence, or a loving-kindness practice. The, th the thing these all have in common is that there is, we're bringing our mind to focus on something in particular that's very beneficial. But um, there is also a, a different meditation practice, which is a kind of objectless awareness. It's not focusing on anything in particular. We call that practice shikantaza, just, just sitting, just sitting with nothing being uh, an object of focus. And this is um, actually, hello. <laughs> I'm just looking for the donation bar. Um, what are you looking for? No, no, the donation bar. Oh, it's over on that side just there. This objectless awareness, we've just got some people who have just popped in to donate some money to the temple. <laughs> this objectless awareness, just sitting, um, is unexpectedly quite a difficult thing to do. And that's because uh, our mind just likes to think. Mm -hmm. And as many of us know, um, in the Buddhist psychology, we have six senses, uh, whereas in conventional sort of Western uh, psychology, we tend to think of just five senses, you know, seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting. But in Zen and in Buddhism, we add the sixth, which is thinking. And I think this is incredibly instructive because it can help us to be aware that just like the eyes see whether they want to or not, they just do it, and our ears just hear, our mind also just thinks. And that's its job, for the mind to think. And there's nothing wrong with its thinking. 
but we are, we are uh, wanting to be beneficial in this world. So therefore, we're particularly interested in what our mind thinks. We're just particularly interested in it, and um, want to uh, steer our mind to think in ways that are beneficial to the world. And one one of the ways to do that is to quiet the mind right down, to really quieten it right down. Because the mind's habit is to think, we get so used to it thinking that sometimes the thinking uh, gets away from us and, and we can't really rein it in. It just keeps on doing its own thing and it's more like it's the master. And, um, and we can then end up thinking things that are un, unbeneficial, unwholesome. I like the story of uh, Angulimala, um, who for various reasons, we don't need to go into right now, but for various reasons he felt compelled to have to kill 100 people. <laughs> and so he had, at this point, killed 99 people, and people were terrified of him. He'd been rampaging through villages, but no one had been able to catch him. And he was about to find his mother so he could kill her as his 100th person. And as he came into the village to search for his mother, uh, the Buddha was there and everybody else had scattered and run away to get away from him out of fear. But the Buddha was not scared and the Buddha stood there and Angulimala was kind of uh, shocked that the Buddha was just standing there. And they looked at each other and then the Buddha just turned and started walking away. Not running away, just started walking away. And Angulimala was sort of in a state of shock, wondering what was going on. And as the Buddha started to walk away and had got a certain distance, he started to run after the Buddha to kill him. But no matter how fast he ran, he couldn't catch up to the Buddha. He was just walking very slowly, like we do in Kinhin. He was just walking very peacefully and very slowly and Angulimala was running at full force with his mind racing, trying to catch up to the Buddha. And he shouts out, stop, stop. And the Buddha calmly turns around and looks at him and says, I have stopped. It is you that has not stopped. And when Angulimala heard this, all of his thoughts in his mind, all of his ideas about what he needed to do, what was wrong with the world, what was wrong with himself, how he needed to conduct himself, all of those thoughts just completely just dropped away. And he fell to his knees and then put his forehead to the ground at the Buddha's feet and said, please, can I be your disciple? It's, it's a wonderful story. There's more at the beginning and more at the end. This is just the middle section. And uh, it's often brought tears to my eyes, this moment where the Buddha says to him, I have stopped. It is you that has not stopped. And then Angulimala stops. His mind stops. I think we intuitively know that there is something very beneficial about being still and silent. Physically still, mentally still. But particularly mentally still, I think we just sort of know that it's important to be still. It's out of stillness that wisdom comes. I think all of us just in our ordinary lives find these moments to be still. You know, going to bed at night, sometimes that moment of the head is on the pillow and people often just have an outbreath like, ah, oh, the day is over. <laughs> it's like, what a relief. <laughs> the day is over. I rest my head on the pillow. 
or, or going to a cafe, strangely enough, seeing people drink coffee, but still going to a cafe and sitting down at a table in a chair. It's like a little moment that's a little oasis. Now I am just sitting here. Now I don't need to talk to anyone or do anything. I'm just sitting here. Or sometimes when people get home from work. Again, this has been a little distorted by our uh, consumerist society, unfortunately. So people often come home and go to the fridge and take out a beer and then sit down on the couch. Open the beer. Ah, now I can rest. Or turn on the television or their laptop. Now I can rest. So it's uh, been a little co-opted by our society's uh, encouragement for us to be entertained and to consume. But nevertheless, if you look behind, I think you can see that all of us know there's something very important about doing nothing. Just having a quiet mind. In the Buddhist teachings, it's said that this silent, still place is where illumination arises. And the teaching is, uh, Shikantaza teaching is often called silent illumination. In that stillness and in that silence, our true nature is illumined. Our true nature becomes clear to us. our Buddha nature, our true nature, our interconnected nature, our basic, perfect nature. We don't need to be doing anything to justify our existence, just that we are alive it means that we are worthy and valuable. And we are part of this huge mosaic just that is enough. So uh, this stillness is where we can feel that rightness, that rightness about ourselves. When nothing needs to be done, we can decide to do something, but nothing needs to be done. One of our ancestors from the 12th century in China, uh, Hong Zhu, is most famously known for um, describing in poetic terms this silent illumination, this way of uh, drinking from this well of stillness and silence, and being illuminated in that stillness and silence. And he uh, contributed to sort of gathering a collection of stories about that, which Wong Song ended up compiling into the Book of Serenity, which we are studying in our koan group. So there's a koan in here. Case 21. Yunyan sweeps the ground. As Yunyan was sweeping the ground, Dao Wu said, Too busy. Yunyan said, You should know there is one who isn't busy. Dao Wu said, If so, then there's a second moon. Yunyan held up the broom and said, which moon is this? Which moon is this? So this is a, a beautiful dialogue. And we see this a lot in the koan tradition where two great teachers sort of engage in a dharma um, 
Dharma battle is probably a little too strong a word, but a Dharma moment, an opportunity to see what's going to happen, a kind of playful exchange. So Yun Yan is sweeping the grounds, which of course is what uh, monks do in temples as part of their samu, as part of their daily work practice, is to sweep. So he's sweeping the grounds and Dao Wu says, too busy. It's like a little challenge. The way I think of it is he's sort of saying, are you busy? Are you paying attention to sweeping the ground or are you busy thinking about something else? What's happening while you're sweeping? It's not a criticism or anything like that. It's just a little, little poke to see what's going to happen. Just a little poke. Too busy. And Yun Yang you know, is able to just respond. You should know there is one who is not busy. So this is the quality that, we, that we're wanting to be able to carry in our lives, that we can do something but not be busy at the same time. We can be even doing something that looks busy. We could be doing something that involves a lot of attention. But if we are giving ourselves wholeheartedly to the task, without being distracted by parallel sets of thoughts about all sorts of other things, past and future and ideas and opinions and so on. Then we can be not busy at the same time. And, and we see this, you see this uh, with mature practitioners that they're engaged in activity but they seem to not be particularly busy. They're just doing things and they might be doing a lot of things. You know, they might be doing lots of things, but they're not busy. I like to say that sometimes when people say, I know you're busy, but I was wondering if we could talk about something. I quite like to say, oh, I'm not busy. I'm not busy. We can definitely find time. So then Dao Wu sort of challenges him and says, oh, you know, so if you're saying there's one who's busy sweeping and there's one who's not busy, then you're saying there's two, two moons. Like it sounds like you're saying like there's like a dualistic thing going on here. So again, it's just, he, he doesn't really think this. He's just seeing what's going to happen. He just gives another little poke. And then Yun Yan just beautifully cuts through the whole thing and holds up the broom. How many moons is this? You know, it's, um, we are completely integrated when we're truly engaged in what we, were, we are doing with a, a gentle mind. There's no split whatsoever. We're 100% just attending to the present. So it's interesting just to... Uh, Imagine that for ourselves, that we can go about our day and um, not be especially busy. I think the busyness that people feel is because while they're doing one thing, they're thinking about the next thing, or the next thing and the next thing, and then they're feeling overwhelmed. So while they're doing this thing, they're starting to feel overwhelmed, and their breathing is starting to get shallower and faster, and the thoughts are starting to move quicker. How am I going to get this all done by the end of the day? How am I going to get this done by the end of the week? That kind of thing. This is too much. I can't do it all. So this practicing of uh, shikantaza helps us to return. So I'll I'd like to describe a kind of meditation practice I've been doing um, for quite a few years just kind of made it up but based on things that my teacher taught so it's nothing new but it's just the way that I the sort of a way I go about moving towards shikantaza and you might like to try it as well so starting off begin by paying attention to the breath so it's four four part meditation first just paying attention to the breath. For however long 
it takes to just relax and do that. Maybe three breaths or four breaths or one breath. And then, and so this is sort of first. Can you hear me online? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Something happened to one of the laptops. I don't know if we can record now. We probably can't. It doesn't matter. So I'll just um, was starting to go through this meditation sequence. Oh, look, there's a little symbol. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, I'll just let it go. <laughs> so I want to go through this meditation sequence in case you'd like to try it. So the first part, paying attention to the breath, sort of being very present, then expanding that attention to sound. So it's starting to open up. And once that, once you're sort of feeling relaxed and settled and spacious in this uh, wider awareness of sound, then bringing the focus into this question, am I aware? And of course we answer, yes, I am aware. And then we can sort of question, how do I know I'm aware? And for many people, when they examine this sense of being aware that they are aware, you kind of have this feeling that you're behind your eyes, being aware of your own awareness. I think this is where the sort of idea of the third eye comes from, because when you're aware that you're aware, and you have your eyes closed, you notice it from behind your eyes. So resting in this sense of, I'm aware that I am aware. It's just kind of subtle and takes a little while to practice being aware that you are aware. And it might take you know quite a few periods of zazen to get used to this idea of being aware that you're aware and just sitting and staying with it. A thought comes in, come back. I'm aware that I'm aware. And then if if thoughts keep on coming back, you just go back to the beginning. Pay attention to the breath. Become aware of sounds. Then notice that you're aware that you're aware. So once. You've done this for a little while and you can kind of move through those three. Then this is where we're moving into Shikantaza. Then you just open out into a broad general awareness, not of anything in particular, just awareness itself. It's a very refreshing feeling to simply be aware of nothing in particular because this nothing in particular is actually how things are. There is no thing in particular. There's no separate thing unrelated to any other thing. Everything is completely inter interconnected and there's no boundary that we can locate anywhere. So 
practicing this kind of awareness, unbounded awareness, is in accord with how things are. And it's incredibly refreshing. And you can just be in that state for literally like a second or two before a thought happens. And you can either just let that thought drift by like a cloud and then just continue to be in this spacious space and another thought just goes past. And then when thoughts start to kind of accumulate and get a little bit heavy, like maybe a darker cloud, then you just return to the breath and start again. So describing it sounds a little bit hectic, but actually it's not at all. It's very easy to move through these four steps. This is what I do. Some people are able to just sit down and decide, I'm going to do shiken taza, just sitting. And they can just go straight into objectless awareness. But for me, I find moving through this sequence just uh, helps me to sustain that object awareness for just a little longer. So just to finish up, the purpose of that isn't that there's anything miraculous in and of itself about uh, objectless awareness, but it does have the effect because I think it's our, um, it's natural for us to want to be still and silent. So the natural wisdom seems to arise, this luminosity seems to arise. If you think of someone like Angulimala, you can't really imagine that if he, if he could experience that wide, spacious, just general awareness, he just wouldn't feel like killing people, just kind of like doesn't go together. All right, well, I think I'll stop there and see if anybody would like to ask any questions or make any comments on online or in the Zender. Yes, Archer. Um, one thing I don't fully understand is how the guys walking the Buddha walking the swan and yet the guys running that four day. Yes. Yes. So I was just wondering, in case you couldn't hear, how is it possible that the Buddha could walk slowly and uh, Angulimala could be running at full pace but not catch up to him? Yeah. And a lot of, in a lot of the, the Buddha's stories, they're kind of symbolic. So in a way, one is the Buddha's mind is peaceful and at ease and Angulimala's mind is really fast. It's not really so much that the Buddha is walking slowly and that he is running. It's more that the Buddha's mind is at peace and Angulimala's mind is race, race, racing. And I think all of us have had that experience that sometimes we actually get more done when we're a little calmer than when we're frantic. Sometimes, you know, people often have that experience, especially across their whole life. Sometimes people work in a job for years and years and years extremely busy every single day, hectic, hectic, hectic. And then they retire and, and have this feeling of like, what was that all about? What, why did I do that? And that they can have a kind of, it's a very sad feeling of kind of emptiness about in the, in the conventional sense of why did I rush so much? All those years I was rushing, rushing, rushing. So sometimes rushing around, running fast and rushing around mentally or physically looks like it's achieving things but sometimes what it's achieving aren't very valuable or sometimes are actually harmful as in the story of Angulimala. Whereas if we do things steadily and calmly in our mind, as I say, you're still in your body, you can be doing things quite quickly but in your mind you are calm, calmness and stillness we can have that like we do with our mudra. The right hand is activity and the left hand, left hand is equanimity. We hold it together in the mudra. We have activity and stillness coming together in our mudra. There's nothing wrong with activity. 
but a still mind, attentive mind at the same time is what makes our activity uh, satisfying. So that's kind of, it's sort of a story that's mm -hmm. simple. And Angulimala can actually meet the Buddha, meet up with the Buddha when his mind is still, when he drops all of those thoughts of killing people and instead bows down and says, can I be your disciple? Then they're able to meet. Then he can catch up, in a sense, to the Buddha. Yeah. Um, Jack, while she's driving. Uh, I can't hear you though, you're on mute. Okay, she's, I think she wants to say something, but she can't figure out how to unmute while she's driving. <laughs> oh, I think maybe she put something in the chat. This is a different. No, no, I just have to let that move. <laughs> she's pointing at something. <laughs> I don't know what she's, she's trying to do something, pointing at something. <laughs> oh. Yeah, she's bowing and smiling, so I don't know what that was. I'm sure it was very wonderful. <laughs> I'm probably doing something I can't tell. She's illustrating the story. Ah, okay. <laughs> Wanting to catch up and offer a comment, but being too busy with this other activity that is totally occupying her as well. Okay, she's nodding. I think you might be onto something there, Russ. Okay, any, anything else? Yes, Brendan. Yeah, I really like the koan. Um, I think it really points to that that stillness that you're speaking of is not separate from movement or sound or, or anything. It's, it can't be found as such as an object. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Brendan, you might not have been able to hear that. Was just saying he liked the the koan story that uh, stillness and movement are not separate from each other. I think I particularly like that because I'm a bit of a rushing around type of person. My personality is a little like that, so and I can say that's okay. <laughs> I can I can be a bit of a person that has to be careful not to get too many speeding tickets and still be a practitioner. It's okay, there is a way <laughs> to be active and still at the same time. Stillness doesn't mean we have to move slowly. It's just moving with awareness. Moving with awareness is a form of stillness. Yes, like in that story, Yunyan might have been sweeping quite vigorously. We don't, it doesn't say. He might have been sweeping quite vigorously. And then Daowu said, You yeah. look pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> Too busy. <laughs> you should know there is one who is not busy. <laughs> yeah. Bill? Yeah, I was just wondering if there's other stories like this, if it's kind of common for these stories of masters like challenging each other. Yes, there's lots of challenging stories. Yeah, in the Cohen collections. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I like them because they're 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 kind of they're playful, but they're also like serious and playful at the same time. Like we're talking about Dharma. Let's see what happens. And often in the stories when it's through, when it's between two well-known masters, it's like this, where there's no winner or loser there. One's facilitated the other sharing the Dharma, in a 
so it's, it's beautiful well, I will facilitate this for you kind of thing but then sometimes there's stories when it's uh, a monk with the teacher and the monk's challenging the teacher um, and then the teacher kind of more or less pulls the rug out from under the monk the monk of course he's not really ready to to be able to play in that way um, yeah and, so, and, and I like it in some of those stories that the monk can then kind of like pick him, pick him or herself up again and still continue a bit. And, uh, yeah, yeah, there's lots of them. Book of Serenity and the Blue Cliff Record. The Mulong Khan. Yes, Archer? Where do you find the co op? Like, do you have to, like an e book or something to look at? There's, um, well, there's lots of different collections, but there's four main ones. This one has got a hundred koans in it. And so there's, in the tradition that we're a part of, um, well, I'm kind of part, I'm part of two different traditions. In the Diamond Sangha tradition, we study four of these books. And so people can study them one at a time. And in the Soto tradition, this, this particular book, the Book of Serenity, is the most commonly studied. Yeah. All right, well, I think we can finish for today, and um, I hope this just uh, inspires you to, to practice a little bit with Shikantaza. Just sit in. Okay, so we'll finish with our. Uh, Bodhisattva vow chant and three three prostrations. Things are numerous. I vow to say.